Okay, so um, why don't we begin? So welcome everybody to the webinar. We're going to be uh, presenting the results of a 27 country survey of public opinion and attitudes about transgender people and transgender issues. So I wanted to go over a few uh, logistical issues. Um, people are joining via the web and via the phone. If you're having any problems with audio uh, via the web, it's probably best to call in via the phone. Um, and hopefully the phone number was included in the confirmation email that you received. Uh, this webinar platform works best with particular browsers, but actually if you're listening to this, you've already surmounted that barrier. Uh, the moderator has muted everybody, but um, when it comes time to speak, if you would like to unmute yourself, then the, the all you have to do is press star 7, and to mute yourself again, press star 6. But we ask that everybody keep themselves muted during the presentations. We're going to go through all three presentations. I'll give a little introduction, and the other two speakers will follow. During that time, if you want to type questions and comments into the box that you will probably see under uh, a window called chat on the left-hand side of your screen, we will address the questions after the presentations are finished. So it, w it would be good to, for people to type in the questions while the presentations are happening. Um, <clears throat> my name is Andrew Park. There we go. Um, and so I'd like to introduce our two panelists. Uh, we have Julia Clark, who's uh, the Vice President of EPSOS in Chicago, and she will also introduce herself and talk about what EPSOS is, and she's going to present the findings of the study. We also have um, Andrew Flores, who uh, is a well-known expert in issues about surveying public opinion regarding LGBT people and LGBT issues. Um, he's currently on the faculty at Mills College, and he's also a visiting scholar with the Williams Institute. Um, so I just wanted to give a quick context of issues dealing with transgender people around the world. Let me say that um, this is a very rapidly changing area of the law globally, so it's difficult for me year to year to pin down what exactly um, the status is because things change sometimes literally uh, week to week. But these are some of the issues that countries are dealing with. And rather than go into what, uh, where each country is, which would, could fill many webinars by itself, let me just say that um, international human rights norms do provide a standard that countries should meet if they want to fulfill the human rights of transgender people. Uh, for the most part, these norms can be found in the Yogi Carta Principles, which is a document that analyzes how international human rights law applies to gender identity and gender expression, among other things. There was an update to the Yogi Carta Principles uh, in the past few weeks, and the update uh, identifies new norms that are developed in the past few years. So those norms are that transgender people should be able to um, uh, obtain identity documents regardless of their gender identity and gender expression. They should be able to change the information, uh, the gender marker of those documents uh, without any prerequisites. But also the new principles question whether governments should in the first place even list somebody's gender in documents and databases and the principles conclude that where gender is not relevant, governments should abolish the practice of listing gender. Uh, another principle that has been recognized is the right to sanitation, which is usually recognized in the context of access to clean water, but here it's recognized in the context of access to bathrooms, which is a growing issue uh, regarding transgender populations around the world. There's also a social context, and I bring this up to say that it's quite complicated. So we have uh, terms cisgender, somebody who was assigned a particular sex at birth and who is uh, currently uh, identifying and living as that same gender. Um, transgender, gender expansive, and gender not conforming. We also have different areas where we derive what a person's gender is, either their inner awareness, their expressed gender, their socially assigned gender or their legally assigned gender. 
And of course, there are different gender categories, which are reflected both in culture and in the law. So uh, some systems have a binary system of male and female. Some systems recognize a third gender. Uh, some, well, not legally actually at this point, but socially, some uh, people recognize themselves as gender expansive or not ad adhering to any particular uh, norms of a specific gender. <clears throat> and um, in terms of demographics, the data that we have is very, very thin, but the estimates are that uh, transgender people, depending on how you define it, uh, comprise between 0.03% and 0.12% of the population, depending on the definition. Um, one of the best studies is probably one that was recently done here in the United States that concluded that uh, for adults, the population in the U.S. is 0.06%. Uh, okay, um, and then the last thing I wanted to address is why do a survey? One thing is that surveys are not always the best way to answer a research question. So the first uh, thing out of the block is um, it, what is the best way to answer the uh, question that we have? Four questions of public opinion surveys um, are very effective and uh, are probably a, one of the better options. But surveys like this also allow us to assess the level of support and opposition to transgender people. In a sense, it can be considered a measure of stigma. And it allows us to understand what people think in order to craft messages and responses. Um, and crafting those messages and responses based on what people actually think, as opposed to what we think they think, um, will ensure more effective uh, programs and advocacy measures. And lastly, there's a political use to surveys. And I think what we're going to see is that the support for transgender issues is pretty decent, in some places quite strong. And this is um, a thing that we can go to leaders with and assure them that they, as political leaders, won't lose support if they embrace pro-transgender legal reforms. Okay, so now I would like to turn it over to uh, Julia Clark, who's going to explain uh, how the survey began and what IPSOS is. Um, and I want to thank IPSOS as well because uh, IPSOS did this and it's, uh, uh, as a pro bono project um, without charging anybody. Um, and IPSOS is a very high quality firm and sometimes can be a little pricey. So <laughs> I think this probably would not have happened, oh, I can absolutely say this would not have happened had it not been for the interest of IPSOS and Julia in this issue. Uh, Julia, go ahead. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, I, I appreciate that, and it is very much a pleasure to be joining you um, and the participants in this call. Um, thank you also for the kind words. Um, you know, Ipsos, uh, and I can explain a little bit about who we are, um, but essentially our, our, our remit for the, for the team that I sit on, which is our public affairs division, is really about uh, bringing voice to people through data. Um, and I, I am, I'm personally very passionate about this particular issue, but, um, um, you know, we were able to do this because, because uh, you know, we, we first and foremost believe that, that sort of truth in terms of what the public think is, is, um, is essential, uh, you know, to a functioning society, to democracy, et cetera. Um, so it was, it was absolutely a delight to, to get involved in this work and, of course, to, to work alongside um, the team at the Williams Institute. Um, uh, very briefly, um, I, I'm, a, I'm a social researcher. Um, I, I, I do a lot of different things, but I would say that um, one of my areas of real uh, sort of specialism is in global research, um, and global research um, often on topics that are not universally understood. And I, I'll pivot from the point Andrew just made about um, the attitudinal value of a study like this. Um, and, and measuring stigma, essentially, right? Where do attitudes sit now and where are they going? Um, because the objective certainly with this type of work is to continue tracking it over time and Ipsos will continue to do so, so that we can assess changes, um, good or bad, on uh, global attitudes and country level attitudes on these issues. 
and I can I consider it sort of a, a part of my remit when I when I work with clients and and um, and parties interested in these issues to to remind them that the, the closer we are personally to an issue, often the less perspective we have on how the public perceive this issue. And so today, of course, we're talking about transgender people and transgender rights. Um, but this would apply to any host of issues whereby um, the people who are most invested in either advocacy um, or other operation, operational elements of, of the communications around any issue, uh, policy, politics, et cetera, um, often need public opinion data to keep communications grounded in, in, in sort of the public reality, regardless of our own opinion. So um, th that's, uh, that's sort of why we came to uh, this study uh, and, and, and my perspective in terms of speaking about, about the data. Um, I've, I just, as my bio, sorry, I've, I've, I've worked in research over 15 years um, in London and D.C., and now I'm, I'm based out in Chicago. Um, I cannot advance the slides, I've realized. So, Andrew, if I could trespass on you, please, to, to advance to the next slide. Um, with the map, exactly. This is sort of where EPSIS is. We do uh, research everywhere. I won't belabor it too much, um, but we are a big um, global research company who does uh, work in the commercial, um, nonprofit, not for profit, NGO, and government spaces. Um, if you wouldn't mind advancing once more, please, Andrew. Um, I have a few slides here about um, the methodology of the study, and I, I will touch on this because it's very important um, as we go into the data for you all to understand how the study was conducted, um, the, you know, what strengths the study has, and there are some weaknesses too, which we want to be very transparent about. Um, and uh, I, I, I won't go to, into too much depth on some of these issues, though, because Andrew Flores will be speaking uh, after me uh, specifically to some of the challenges, really, of doing research uh, on this particular topic uh, at a global level. Um, but just broadly speaking, methodologically, um, this is run, uh, this is a study Ipsos runs, not this particular set of questions, but a survey vehicle Ipsos runs every month uh, in 27 countries um, uh, around the world. Uh, it is run online, which is one of the very important caveats as you, as you consider this data. And as I go through the findings, um, of this uh, of the of the study in this webinar, I will be focusing not on all 27 countries, but just on uh, the 16 countries uh, for which um, Ipsos believes that um, an online study can be nationally representative. Because if you think about a country, for example, like South Africa, like India, both of which were included in this study, um, internet penetration, especially among uh, lower income, lower education, and more rural households, is very very low. And so even though we do capture opinions uh, from uh, those demographic socioeconomic groups, um, we don't necessarily have the confidence to say this is a representative of the country. However, in the 16 that are included here, um, which are listed as you can see, um, we feel uh, confident, uh, given the internet penetration in these countries uh, and the structure of the panels themselves that were utilized, uh, that we can speak to this as a general public survey that is representative of views of the country as a whole. Um, and Andrew, if you wouldn't mind advancing once more, there's a little bit of redundant information on this subsequent slide that I don't want to read through. Uh, it is there should you, <laughs> should you choose to read it. But two important notes there um, are that about uh, 500 or 1,000 interviews were conducted in each country, uh, meaning it is uh, fairly robust uh, from an end size, from a sample size perspective. I would also note, importantly, that this study was originally developed in 2016 uh, by Ipsos in partnership with um, uh, the LGBTQ editor of BuzzFeed News uh, and the Williams Institute. Um, and so it was, it was envisioned then and actually had, as you'll sort of see in, in the study itself, uh, an additional focus on uh, what was going on in India, and we, we did a face-to-face -face survey in India at the time as well. Um, so some of the questions have, um, have specific angles because we were looking at that issue specifically, um, but we, uh, Ipsos ourselves this year um, uh, developed um, some additional questions that we added on on our own. Um, the questionnaire is on the next two pages, uh, Andrew, if you wouldn't mind advancing there. Um, it was fielded, uh, this study I should note, uh, at the end of last year in October and November, um, so the, the, the data was captured a few months ago. Um, again, I won't read through all of the detail of this questionnaire now. It is absolutely available uh, in any of the documentation that will be on the Williams, uh, web, Williams 
instance, to website and, and Ipsos' own website as well. Um, but just to give you a sense of it, we first asked what we're calling the proximity question uh, around sort of familiarity with transgender people. Um, and Andrew Flores will discuss that in a bit more detail following my section. We then asked a few series of questions about um, essentially, uh, you know, if people believe um, transgender individuals, or we didn't use that word, should be allowed to do various things, which touches on policy. And Andrew, again, if you wouldn't mind advancing, please. Um, uh, and, and then we, we got into a, a series of agree-disagree statements about transgender individuals themselves, right, um, and, and sort of who they are and how people perceive them. And again, these were driven by um, some, of the, some of the dynamics uh, focused on an India-specific study, but also uh, from a global perspective. Uh, the new question that Ipsos added this year was around pronoun usage, which was only uh, asked in English-speaking countries. And then um, a, a few statements um, which touch on, on both rights and, and, and policy and safety, uh, some of which are new um, and some of which were asked uh, last time. So I will dive, I think, right into the data, um, if, if you wouldn't mind advancing the slide again, please, um, and start with the, with the general um, and then winnow down to the more specific in terms of these findings. Um, and as, as, as I think has been made, made clear, you know, we're very happy to take questions on data specifics. Um, all of the country level data tables, which will include breakdowns by age, gender, uh, education, region, other uh, uh, demographic dimensions, uh, for every single country included in the study, including um, the, the, all 27, not just the 16 representative, uh, will be made available um, for, for anybody who wishes to use them. Um, I would note that, um, as I said, all 27 uh, countries' data are being released, um, you know, with the caveat that I already mentioned that in some of these countries, um, uh, you know, public opinion being captured online means uh, the representativity has, has probably an asterisk next to it and likely skews slightly more um, high education, a high income and urban um, than a nationally representative sample would. So now to genuinely dive into the findings. Um, as Andrew Park mentioned, um, there's some real, some real positivity, I think, that, that comes out of this study. Um, and, and on some of these, I was, I was even almost pleasantly surprised. Um, so the first uh, tranche of questions I'm, I'm, ask, I've, I'm touching on here are, relate to really sort of broad societal acceptance and tolerance. Because if we're thinking about um, policy framing, right, where does public opinion sit so that communications with stakeholders or, or, or politicians or policymakers or influencers, um, you know, the first step is to really understand where public, public opinion lives on an issue because a, a, you know, a, a politician is interested in being convergent rather than divergent with public opinion. And so, um, so tactically, it's, it's critical to really understand this. And 60% uh, of, 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 the, of, the, of the public in, in these 16 countries uh, believe their country is becoming more tolerant towards transgender people. So that is, you know, that is over half. I think that's a positive finding. Um, but even more positive to me is the appetite for this protection and support of transgender individual, which is um, over 50% over 50 again, 55, so just over, but still. Um, I think that in, in many ways is, is more powerful because um, as we'll see on the next slide when we look at the country level data, um, becoming more tolerant isn't necessarily something that all people see as positive. However, the, the subsequent statement about wanting the country to do more is positive. And that 55 number I'm talking about is the 25 plus 30, so the green plus the blue, blue bar are the two agree statements there. Right? And then, of course, we do have a core of, of anti-transgender or transphobic uh, sentiment that is present throughout this survey, and it's differential by country, and I will get into that. Um, but I think, on average, across all the measures we've looked at, it looks like we have about a third, just under a third, uh, of folks who are, are simply, you know, you know, they're simply against uh, or, or, or scared or, or somehow otherwise um, uh, anti-transgender. And so this is, is present, it's persistent, but it is absolutely a minority. Um, so worrying about exposure of children at a third, 35%, uh, violating the traditions of my culture at 29%, and um, perhaps most disconcerting is the quarter, 25%, who think society has gone too far 
um, in allowing people to dress and live as one sex, even though they were born uh, another. Um, so as I said, we have that, that um, core of anti-transgender sentiment, uh, but it is a minority. And if you wouldn't mind advancing the slide, um, what I think is interesting to look at here is um, where we see the most uh, and least positivity. So the green um, shading are the, are, the, are the positive statements, and the red, those with red shading are, are negative statements about transgender individuals. Um, and as you can see, and this will be found throughout, um, we see in Argentina, uh, Canada, uh, France and Germany to a certain extent, but definitely Great Britain, um, Sweden, um, general sort of positivity in terms of wanting the country to do more. Spain is particularly high there at, at 70%. Um, and then you see in the darker red shading in the lower ones where some of the pockets of anti-transgender sentiment are higher. Serbia uh, is certainly one of them, and if Russia was included here, it isn't given the representativity of the survey, but you'd see it even more pronounced, um, I think, for you know, obvious reasons there as well. Um, disconcertingly for me, based here in the US, um, but perhaps not surprisingly, is that we do see some, some um, darker red shading uh, in the US around especially uh, that over a third of Americans feeling society has gone too far. Uh, on this issue. Um, so, so again, there's a balance of positive and negative here, but one of the reasons we lined up the data this way that I want to draw attention to here uh, for a way that the data can be um, utilized or activated from a policy perspective is, um, let's look at, at Serbia, for example. We see 69% saying the country is becoming more tolerant, but only 48% saying they want the country to do more. So this tension um, is sort of what I alluded to before, where we see the notion of becoming more tolerant is not necessarily seen as a positive thing, because just under half of Serbians actually want more protections, but over two-thirds think the country is moving in that direction. And so there's, there's quite a few of these countries where that, that, that first row, if you will, the country's tolerance, that figure is a higher percentage than that second row around wanting the country to be doing more to protect. But the most interesting, I think, for me at least, are where those numbers are flipped. Where is, in which countries are, um, is the populace's appetite for protection and support higher than what they believe the country is currently delivering? And it's in particular France, Germany, and Italy, where we see higher proportions 52 for France, 60 for Germany, and 59 for Italy. Higher proportions saying they want the country to do more than the proportion saying they currently believe the country is becoming more tolerant. And for me, that dynamic is interesting because it says to me, it you know, legislate. This is almost this is almost. <laughs> This is almost the, the, the sort of the lowball serve, right, for a legislative agenda. This is something on which the population would like to see more being done than currently exists, right, rather than the reverse where, where um, you know, there may be more public resistance to the issue even if there is a, a minor majority support. So I hope that makes sense, but, but looking at that, that dichotomy between those two numbers for me is very interesting from a poli policy perspective. So moving towards, and if you wouldn't mind advancing the slide again, please, moving towards that policy-oriented um, agenda uh, towards rights as opposed to broad societal accept, uh, acceptance or, or, or tolerance, if you will. Um, the next series of, of statements relates to um, essentially allowance, rights, right, law. Um, not explicitly, and of course in a survey that's global, we can't get too far into the detail, as, as Andrew Park alluded to, of specific um, country level uh, legislation because it's so, so variable country to country and even sort of month to month in, in some cases. So we've tried to go with some broader categories, obviously some of which connect to recent legislation in some countries, you know, the military service being an example. Um, here for uh, the, the, the Trump administration's um, decision uh, in the United States. Um, but what we see here, again, is actually very positive and heartening. Um, more than 50% on every single one of these measures agree that transgender people should be 
um, allowed or conferred a specific set of rights um, and protections, right? Um, now, there's a sliding scale here um, with the most 70% um, agreeing that protection from discrimination is important um, and two-thirds that surgery, that, that transgender people should be allowed to have surgery uh, so that their body, of course, matches their identity. And then we see um, similar proportions actually agreeing with um, marrying essentially you know, who they want, uh, service in the military, uh, and slightly smaller proportions, but still well over 50% around the birth and adoption of children. Um, the bathroom or restroom issue um, is the one that's, that's just at 50%, or 51% rather, um, and, and we'll see where that's most uh, high and low in some of the country level data. Um, and it is the lowest in terms of support there, but you, it's still above 50%, right? So what this, what this says to me is that there is clear public appetite for protections um, uh, it, it, and codified into policy uh, on transgender rights and, and protection re related issues. And, and the prioritization scale, even though the, the question wasn't framed quite this way, how I'm thinking about it is, <laughs> and maybe it's my, my psychology background coming in here, but almost the hierarchy of needs, right? If, you know, if we know about Maslow, um, where safety comes first, right? Protection from discrimination. Self comes second, um, right, which is surgery so that, so that the self and the body are matched. And then subsequent to that, it's, it's family and work and other things around uh, marriage and, 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 and adoption and, and children, et cetera. Um, now, the restroom one, I would actually, you know, arguably is more of a, a safety issue, right? And so maybe one on which um, some of the, some of the um, transphobic and anti-transgender um, rhetoric, certainly in some countries, has, has really pushed that issue further, further up the agenda or, or in a way that is, that is more problematic. Um, but looking at the country-by-country country data, if you wouldn't mind advancing to the next slide, um, we again see um, the countries that are our darkest green here uh, are most positive regarding rights and protections. Argentina, Germany, Great Britain, Canada, Spain, um, Sweden, and even the United States here is, a, is, um, is fairly strong on this. Now, what I realized as I was going through these is the bathroom question or the restroom question was left off. Um, it's in the data. It's just not on this slide. It wouldn't fit. Um, but I can say that it's very much in line um, with the rest of these trends with Argentina, Germany, Great Britain, and Spain, and Sweden most likely to agree, um, and um, Poland, Serbia, and, and actually South Korea um, on the lower end of that scale, and 47% in the United States. Um, agreeing um, with um, uh, the statement that uh, transgender individuals should be allowed to use the restroom uh, of the sex with which they identify. Um, and, but we see obviously some, some very clear areas um, where some of these things are not as tolerated and some countries where where there's, there's, there's not a clear societal level level of acceptance, where there is a gradation. Italy is a good example here. Italy is among the highest in terms of agreeing with uh, the notion of protection from discrimination, but among the much lower in terms of the adoption of children. And, um, and, and so, you know, while we have some countries that are universally, let's say, more tolerant and universally less tolerant, if we look at countries like France uh, and Italy, um, Belgium and even even um, uh, Serbia to a certain extent, we see um, you know and, and here I'm looking vertically in the columns, we see uh, boxes that are dark green and, and white indicating that you know on some of these um, policy related rights issues, there is a lot of support and on others there really is not. And that's where some of the country specific nuance regarding policy, um, and regarding cultural norms, right, comes very much into play um, and, and where the, the individual country level data is going to be much more useful than these broader um, designations I'm making. 
Um, I am conscious of the time, so we will move along, please, uh, to the next slide, which, which takes us um, from broad society to, to specific policy and rights um, down to individuals themselves. This is transgender uh, individuals themselves, a series of statements, which some of these you can see were, were a little bit informed by the work we, we were doing in India, spiritual gifts in, in, in particular, um, uh, was asked related to um, uh, hijra uh, in India, uh, I think is the correct pronunciation. Um, but um, but this this essentially looks at um, looks at tolerance, looks at uh, like some of the some of the um, issues around transphobia that have come up in a range of countries. Um, and again, I think. Um, I think we see a fairly positive story. I'll start with a negative, which is the 22% who feel there is a disability uh, and, and that, there, uh, that transgender people are committing a sin, um, and, and a quarter, 26, uh, who believe it is a form of mental illness. Um, now, this is disconcerting in the sense that we're talking about you know, a fifth to a quarter of the public agreeing with this. But again, this seems to be a pretty um, narrow and well-defined minority. Um, it, it, it's defined differently in all countries, but on average, those who are more intolerant uh, uh, in terms of transgender issues in individuals skew older, um, more, more religious, um, you know, obviously politically more conservative, all that wasn't measured explicitly in our survey. Um, but uh, it's it sort of... Um, is, is, is the audience, you know, in each country you probably are already aware of that is, is less inclined to, um, to advocate for or accept a transgender individuals. Um, but I would say the flip side of this narrative is that, you know, six in ten feel transgender people are brave and, and over a half that it's a natural, a natural occurrence, right, rather than some... Um, sort of negative illness or, or, or disability. Um, and, and that, to me, um, is heartening. Um, I know it's only half, um, but at the same time, I, I would imagine that 10 years ago, we don't have a survey from 10 years ago, I wish we did, uh, but we would have seen very, very different numbers there. Um, and so I think that w the fact that we have this majority agreement, especially on the positive attribute of bravery, is, um, is, is, is heartening and is encouraging. And, and of course, I mean, the other side of these, um, of these negative statements is the very strong disagreement, for example, um, that we're seeing at 53%. Um, sorry, 63%, excuse me, disagree that transgender individuals are committing a sin, for example. So, you know, there is, there is not only a, a low tolerance of transphobic sentiments, um, but there is, there is a high level of strong disagreement with some of these sentiments as well. Um, and I think that's important to note in terms of looking for pockets of advocacy at a country level. Um, again, with the detailed data tables, it is possible to look, for example, at the 14% of people in the lower right, uh, excuse me, not the 14%, the 49% of people um, in the darkest red bar at the bottom uh, under con committing a sin who are saying, you know, I strongly disagree that transgender people are committing a sin. Who are these people? Are they, are they younger? Are they, more, are they um, you know, higher education, lower education? Where do they live geographically, et cetera? Um, and building coalitions around some of that information um, could be a very helpful way, again, of advocating or pursuing um, policy. Um, just, again, moving to the country level data on the next slide, please, um, we see um, almost, you know, near universal agreement on the bravery um, issue. Japan is an interesting outlier here and in some of the other studies, um, but this actually is, 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 speaks a little bit to the, to the cultural norms of international research. For example, in, in, in all types of research in Japan, commercial, you know, type of shampoo research, all the way down to, you know, governmental and important um, um, social issues, um, we find far less um, likelihood to, to, for um, Japanese respondents to choose answers on either end of the, of the uh, agree-disagree spectrum, for example. They tend towards a middling response rather than an extreme response, and that is, is, is simply cultural. So where, where, uh, in this study, we see Japan trending lower on both 
um, the trans advocacy but also transphobic um, measures that's actually not as helpful in terms of understanding where the Japanese population sits on the issue of transgender advocacy because the way um, uh, the way the, the sort of Japanese people respond to surveys can be uh, very different for example to the way they respond to surveys in in I don't know Great Britain um, which has nothing to do with the topic of the survey and much more to do with societal cultural norms. So uh, I won't get into the detail on that with each and every country, um, but it is worth noting um, uh, as an example in this particular slide where they, where they kind of stand out on that lower agreement with the statement that transgender people are brave. Um, I think I mentioned before that there is a light uh, suggested correlation on religiosity um, and, and an anti-transgender sentiment. Um, I don't think this would come as, as a great surprise to anybody listening on this call, but it's highlighted um, quite uh, clearly um, by the lower right um, box on this slide, uh, the 32% of Americans um, who believe transgender individuals are committing a sin, right? That's a third. Um, and, and I, and I um, and we also have a third believing it's you know mental illness and other things. So despite in, on some measures the United States having fairly uh, high levels of, of acceptance um, and even um, appetite for uh, codified protection, um, there is a minority but a very um, vocal and I would say um, probably fairly unshakable um, at the moment minority um, who are, who are uh, uh, expressing very anti-transgender sentiments um, and often, although not exclusively, this does tie to a religiosity as well. Um, uh, and, and, you know, if we look at Poland and Serbia as well, which, you know, are not only uh, countries whereby religion and, and governance are, are closely related, but also um, where, you know, uh, religious institutions have informed, you know, many policy decisions, you again see that higher level of agreement um, with the notion of sin, with the notion of mental illness, and lower levels of tolerance here. Um, I will move on um, just to wrap up to the, the, the two slides I have on the, on the sort of the pronoun question. Thank you very much for advancing. Um, it was this year wanted um, to get a little bit uh, underneath the notion of uh, correct pronoun usage um, in, in many ways because it's, well, it's, it's it's a, it's a critical step in, in societal and individual level understanding of and acceptance of transgender individuals, the use of the correct um, pronoun, uh, or at least an awareness of the fact that there is a correct, correct or often preferred uh, pronoun. Um, so in some ways it's almost a proxy or latent measure for um, acceptance of transgender individuals. Um, in that society, um, but it's also a little bit, I mean, what, what we don't for sure know is, is as the question was answered, if, if the responses were, were answered out of, you know, incorrectly in some cases out of ignorance or out of, out of sort of malintent, right? If it was an explicitly transphobic sentiment or if it was a, um, a, a simply uninformed sentiment. So this is an area I personally would love to explore in more detail in, in the future in additional studies. But just to, to walk you through it, essentially we asked um, people, and we just did it in English-speaking countries first because it becomes <laughs> very complicated with translation. Um, given the range of essentially languages and how pronoun use is operationalized and then how it's operationalized in the context of transgender individuals. Um, so we started with English speaking. We absolutely will be moving um, to other countries and, and asking this in other languages as, as we're able to. Um, but the question said, which pronoun would you use? when speaking about each of the following people who, you know, live as one sex, uh, sorry, dress and live as one sex even though they were born another. Um, uh, and the first, this first one is um, somebody who was um, assigned or considered male at birth but dresses and lives as a woman, right? So transgender women is what we're talking about here. Um, and, and you have about two in five on average who would use the correct um, pronoun, a feminine pronoun. You have, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, almost the same proportion who say uh, a neutral one or that they don't know. Um, but you have, you know, just over one in ten, um, maybe one in nine, who would use that masculine pronoun. And what's most disconcerting, again, for me here in the U.S., is that that doubles um, in the United States, right? Over two, uh, excuse me, over one in five, 22% saying they would, you know, 
either willfully or out of ignorance use the incorrect pronoun, use that masculine pronoun to refer to a transgender woman. Now, my own personal suspicion, and this is not <laughs> driven by data, but simply by the fact that um, what, well, it is in the sense that I've seen what the other U.S. data is telling me, I would suspect that some of this is malintent um, and, and transphobia rather than um, completely ignorance. Um, there's some very high profile um, transgender women in the United States now, and, and so I think um, ignorance is, is less and less of an explanation for this. Um, but I can't say that with, with total certainty, not being able to, of course, mind read my respondents, unfortunately. Um, and then this, the next slide has um, the same question regarding um, transgender men, and again, exactly the same um, phenomenon, which is, which is what we would expect. It would be surprising. Um, if you wouldn't mind advancing the slide, please, it would be surprising if um, they were notably different. But what we do see here is the same, the same dynamic, where we have Americans um, again, out of will or ignorance, um, more likely than um, respondents in Great Britain, Australia, or Canada to, to misuse the pronoun, right? To, to use a female pronoun for a transgender man. Um, and so I think, I think that seems to be a little bit of the outlier in, in terms of the United States on this issue. Um, but what this slide tells me, um, without a, a focus solely on the US, both of these slides tell me, is that there is certainly a ways to go given the proportion of people who simply don't know um, what to do or, 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 or what, um, what pronoun would be most appropriate or to use. Um, so I will at this point stop, stop talking because I've spoken quite a lot and, and pass over to, to Andrew Flores at uh, the Williams Institute to um, talk more about some of the design challenges um, we faced um, in conceptualizing and operationalizing this type of thing. Hello, everyone. Um, again, thank you for joining. Um, now, I'm going to speak rather quickly regarding survey design challenges, especially challenges that we encountered while conducting this project with each dose back in 2016. Um, and if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, just for background, um, I'm currently a visiting scholar at the Williams Institute, where I was previously a public opinion and policy fellow and director of the public opinion project. Um, my research generally studies attitudes of the general public regarding LGBT people and rights with a particular attention to, especially recently, on transgender people and transgender rights. And I have also participated in studies collecting data on LGBT people in an international context, including a, an in-depth study in Nepal. Um, and if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so one question that was asked in the EPSO survey that raised its own unique challenges um, is one that we call the uh, proximity question. Um, the reason why it is called the proximity question is because we ask how familiar people are with, and I'll just read the question, um, some people dress and live as one sex even though they were born another. For instance, someone who was considered male at birth may feel they are actually female and so dresses and lives as a woman, and some, someone feel, uh, female at birth may feel they, that they are actually male and dresses and lives as a man. How fami familiar, if at all, are you with people like this? Choose as many responses as apply. And as you see the ordering of the responses, um, it goes from I really or never encounter people like this um, uh, to I have seen people like this but do not know them personally to I have acquaintances, um, to I have personal friends or family like this, to finally I myself am like this. Um, and so, we, so it goes from uh, uh, positions are um, uh, highly unfamiliar uh, uh, to narrowing down to greater familiarity and ultimately to I am myself like this. Um, and this question is attempting to operationalize a few concepts. Um, first, it is measuring a level of closeness or familiarity with, um, uh, as, pre as uh, previously defined, transgender people. Um, it is also trying to measure personal interactions with people who are transgender, as well as trying to gauge whether people themselves may self-identify as transgender by this definition. Um, and if you uh, may advance to the next slide. What we found in the 2017 survey um, is that majorities of each country tended to say that they have seen people like this, but they do not know them personally. Um, uh, um, or, and additionally, uh, that they uh, rarely uh, uh, or never encounter people like this. Um, uh, we also see about 9 to 30% say they have acquaintances or personal friends or family like this. And finally, we see that 0 to uh, about 5% um, self-identified as someone like this, depending on which country you look at specifically. Um, um, uh, uh, 
Um, and uh, if we, uh, if you advance to the next slide, please. Uh, if we zero in and uh, on familiarity and closeness to transgender people, we can see that uh, countries uh, such as Mexico, Peru, and Brazil have greater familiarity uh, with countries uh, such as Russia, Serbia, and Japan that are less familiar. Uh, less familiar. Um, and I think it's important to note here that uh, why is it that familiarity and contact uh, or, or why interaction with transgender people may be important? Um, uh, uh, my own research uh, within the U.S. context has shown that the more uh, knowledge and familiarity that people have with uh, uh, transgender people, uh, both personally, but then also just being educated and informed about the concept of transgender and transgender people, that they tend to be more supportive of transgender rights as well as more accepting of transgender people broadly. Um, and then more specifically to interacting and having acquaintances and family and friends who are transgender, my own research with some other colleagues has also shown that um, uh, that personally knowing and interacting with transgender people does reduce um, one's own uh, uh, negative biases um, as well as um, uh, one's own prejudices as it relates to transgender people. And so we do find that those who have a closer co connection and contact with um, uh, transgender people, that they do tend to be more supportive. Um, uh, which is uh, 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 interesting and then also speaks to uh, the role in which mass media and, uh, uh, as Julia previously mentioned, about the emergence of, say, um, uh, uh, personalities who, uh, uh, who ha reach a broad audience who uh, do self-identify as transgender um, as being potentially an important uh, way in which uh, increasing exposure, contact, and, um, and information about uh, what it means to be transgender to a broader public. So um, uh, it was likely to be expected that as uh, greater exposure and greater familiarity uh, 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 occurs, we'll likely see greater, uh, greater uh, levels of tolerance as well as acceptance of transgender people. Um, so uh, if we uh, advance to the next slide, uh, uh, we also see that um, uh, India and Serbia and other countries have a lower proximity to transgender people as currently defined. Um, and so if you look at the ordering of this plot, and you might compare it to the ordering of the previous plot, you might see that uh, the order is uh, almost uh, the reverse uh, of what we saw in the previous plot with um, uh, countries, uh, uh, including uh, uh, Russia and Japan, being higher up on this plot. Um, and then you might also see that uh, countries that were at the top of the previous spot, like Mexico and Peru and Brazil, are now toward the bottom. And these are the countries that um, uh, are, are ordered in the way in which these are the uh, individuals that ha are the countries that have uh, lesser uh, uh, closeness to transgender people and lesser familiarity with transgender people. And what you may find is that, uh, again, as uh, Julia had presented about transgender rights topics, is that um, is that the countries that have uh, uh, broadly uh, less familiarity and less exposure to transgender people are, are correlated with the countries that may also be, um, uh, have less uh, uh, support on transgender rights measures. Um, and so here uh, uh, we see that patterning uh, a little bit. Uh, the pattern is not necessarily one-to-one, -one, though, in the sense that uh, greater familiar, uh, an equal amount of familiarity um, uh, 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 across two different countries may not necessarily correspond to the same degree or magnitude of levels of support for transgender rights um, uh, uh, topics. Um, so it's important to keep that in mind that this relationship between closeness may actually vary by each specific country's context. Um, if you want to advance to the next slide, please. So. Now I want to talk briefly about survey design challenges generally, and then also as it related to this proximity question specifically. Um, so uh, full, uh, as you may notice, that uh, uh, when we ask the questions as it relates to transgender populations and people's understanding, acceptance, and attitudes about transgender people, um, that we did not necessarily use the term transgender. And this was especially uh, uh, difficult um, uh, uh, because uh, we needed to find a terminology and phraseology that allowed us to operationalize the concept of transgender, but in a global context. 
Um, and so, uh, um, and so uh, we, uh, in the deserved survey design, we decided that uh, uh, using the phrases that we had used, for, that I had just recently uh, uh, said, would be a, a better way to more uh, be able to globally assess attitudes towards uh, a population um, that uh, uh, was born, uh, uh, assigned at birth uh, as one sex, and they currently identify uh, 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 current has the current gender identity that may be different than the assigned sex at birth, um, and um, and because the term transgender may be in a highly Western context, especially in the United States, whereas in other contexts, especially in Southeast Asia, where other terminal other terms and other terminologies may actually be used and operationalized. So, um, so just in, uh, in general, that was one specific challenge that we faced in conducting a global survey. Um, one other thing that we also uh, uh, found with the proximity question is that response option order really did matter. Um, we initially filled the survey. Um, as you notice, the, the response option orders that I had mentioned go from most distant uh, familiarity or most unfamiliar to uh, uh, where there was a high level of closeness to the point of self-identifying that if we actually reversed the response option order, that you may actually find that people were uh, 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 selecting I myself am uh, 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 a, trend, uh, a person like this more frequently. Um, and, that was, and, and that's a common uh, uh, occurrence when it comes to um, uh, uh, measuring uh, uh, public opinion uh, is that people may uh, just by happenstance, they call this satisficing, where people just may select the top option just to get through the survey faster. Um, and we noticed that that was a particular challenge as it related to this subject. Um, um, uh, um, I uh, thank you. I see that someone is moving the slides. <laughs> um, uh, I'm, I'm going to try and be quick. Um, and, uh, and so one thing that we have to pay attention to and also be considerate of is that uh, response option orders definitely does matter when we ask this proximity question, and that it also is very sensitive to uh, what the percentages in which people have the propensity to self-identify as transgender using the definition that we use. Um, and when it comes to measurements of, say, LGBT populations and propensity to self-identify, one of the greatest concerns to measurement is making sure that people who do not self-identify as transgender do not accidentally click that box. Um, uh, uh, because we're talking about a relatively small population, that uh, those who tend to, that, that measurement error could definitely distort the final results. So, so basically, the proximity question uh, uh, itself posed this unique challenge. Um, and so if anyone wanted to repeat the study, we do recommend using the most distant to the most close uh, uh, ordering. Um, and then uh, I believe Julia talked about this uh, a little bit, so I won't uh, uh, belabor the point. But um, uh, we do try and only present results in this presentation only of those that had high internet uh, penetration, in part because uh, internet surveys in and of themselves may uh, skew to different demographics for those who have access to internet in different contexts. Um, and then also it's important to think about how surveys recruit their sample um, and, uh, 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 and, and get people to participate. Similar challenges also occur in offline surveys, face-to-face -face surveys, and telephone surveys. Face-to-face um, uh, -face, uh, 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 may introduce uh, uh, what is called social desirability bias. People may not necessarily want to be uh, uh, or appear as um, uh, 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 prejudiced uh, 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 or may want to disclose their true attitudes because of an attempt to save face. Um, uh, and so interacting with an interviewer, uh, either in face-to-face -face modes or in telephone modes, can potentially introduce those biases. Um, and then also, both with online and offline surveys, you, um, you may find that it's much more easier to have internet access, and it may be easier to reach people if they reside in urban centers versus rural locations. Um, and, so, um, and so it's important to think about how the survey is conducted and whether or not there was concerted effort to reach outreach to rural locations uh, in order to make sure that there's a more generalizable sample and representative sample of um, respondents within a certain context. Um, and then finally, uh, there are, of course, ethical considerations to many, uh, to, uh, of course, asking questions, uh, uh, especially as it relates to self-identification, as it relates to sexual and gender minorities. Um, uh, 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 there are countries that there may pose a legal uh, uh, risk 
Uh, um, and so it's important to, when conducting surveys such as this, to consider both country-level context and legalities, and then also to think about the potential risk of disclosure. So this is also, if you're talking about a low propensity, uh, a population that uh, uh, um, is highly unique in a, in a certain context, that the data that you collect cannot, um, by virtue of crossing a bunch of different demographic variables, you might be able to uh, uh, deduce or conclude that an individual, uh, uh, who an individual is, and of course, Folks at Ipsos as well as other survey vendors uh, are very cautious and very careful. But for anyone who's thinking about conducting a survey and operationalizing uh, uh, these concepts, it's very important to uh, have those ethical considerations at the forefront of one's mind and making sure that you're doing due diligence in order to make sure that there is no disclosure risk. And then finally, um, uh, asking questions about LGBT identification, transgender identification, uh, uh, does uh, have the potential to induce a stressor upon your respondents. And so it's always important to balance those, uh, uh, that stress with um, what the results may show for those populations. And then also um, uh, to consider whether it's worthwhile to ask such questions if there may or may not be a meaningful subgroup of analysis of such populations. So to always balance in those uh, costs and benefits into the survey design before going out and collecting the data. Um, and then I will stop there just to make sure that we have, uh, we have very few time for questions. So if you want to advance to the final slide, please. Um, and <clears throat> let me say we've gotten several questions. Uh, uh, most of the questions that have been typed in to me have to do with uh, methodology and access to data. So let me say this. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Williams Institute site. And um, on that, we will link to where the data is available. Um, IPSOS has a transparency policy, so the data is available on their website in you know, more or less a raw form. Um, and as an academic institution, um, UCLA also has a transparency policy, um, so we make data available as well. Um, that website will also answer questions about methodology, or you can email me or other panelists directly. There was also several recommendations for further research, um, and gosh, I couldn't agree more with all of them, so there's that. <laughs> Um, but I wanted to, um, uh, and then there are some other questions that I'll answer directly by email after the webinar is over. Um, Julia, did you want to add anything to what Andrew said? Um, no, uh, well, just one point, which is to say that actually I think one of the points you mentioned, Andrew, I think raised a really critical uh, comment just as we talk about methodologically how the survey was administrated and op administered administered, excuse me, and operationalized, which is that we threw out, and I in particular, used the use the word transgender to refer to people in our survey who answered, um, who, you know, who answered the question that we developed um, as I myself am like that or, or, or assuming that that's the definition that our respondents are, are associating with. Now, yeah, of course, wanna, to uh, Andrew. Julie, wanna, I'm going to show the slide that says, that shows the United States result. Yeah, perfect. And I would I would say that what's yeah, I can speak to that too, but what I would say is that the question wording of living as one sex even though being born another um I mean, that isn't a perfect and whole definition um, for, for certainly everyone, but, you know, definitely for some types of people for um, transgender. And so I would say that we're sort of using them interchangeably throughout this presentation, but there is definitely more nuance to the sort of definitions as utilized here as well as the, the you know true definitions of of these words um, that that have more subtlety to them so um, I think an important thing to, to bear in mind as we're talking about research is that we do have to simplify concepts for a lay audience because it's going to a general public audience right which you typically like to assume is 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 you know you, you need to design a survey so that it could be essentially our, our rule of thumb is so that it could be understood by a 12 year old right if it can be understood by a 12 year old we're fine um, 
And so that is why some simplification of language um, has been used throughout and these words have been used interchangeably. I will speak to the point of the 5% in the United States. Obviously that is inflated. I don't think anybody here um, is thinking that you know 5% uh, of Americans uh, are transgender. Um, and that's, that, <laughs> it looks like that's what this says, but uh, from a practical perspective, I don't think that's um, what anybody, any of us believe. What I will say is that um, definitions from other, um, it, you know, surveys and studies designed at measuring incidents in a population, which typically are not done online, right? We wanted to ask the question because it was critical for this endeavor. This question, this survey is not methodologically designed to measure uh, population incidents in, 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 in terms of a, a very tiny micropopulation like um, the incidence of transgender people in, in a given country. Um, and so um, I would say that there's a few confounding factors. Andrew Flores touched on many of them involving overstatement, satisficing, um, but I would also say that the, the, the way we are defining uh, sort of transgender here, uh, people who live as one sex, live and dress as one sex even though they were born as another, people could be saying that they do that without being people who identify as transgender because we did not use the word transgender in the survey itself at all. Um, so I think that's an important sort of nuance as we're considering the results of this um, that needs to be baked into the way we think about, you know, the findings. So I guess I, I, would, I would just mention that. I would also agree, Andrew um, Park, that, um, you know, Ipsos is making, and all of this will be on the Williams website, but I'm, I'm happy to take direct queries as well. Um, the SPSS with the weights as well as um, the you know, Excel essentially data tables uh, all can be made available as well, of course, as the full questionnaire. Um, uh, we are uh, adherents to the APORS transparency initiative and, and, um, and very, very keen to ensure that the methodology is very clear so that people can make, you know, decisions about the quality of the data itself for them and the purposes for which they're using it, as well as understanding broader implications. And let me just say there was one question about whether, um, uh, and Marcello, the answer is yes to tweeting. Um, the one question is, should information like this be disclosed if governments want to use this information to support the notion that transgender acceptance is already high enough so that governments don't need to do, take any further action? Um, that's, uh, there's no right answer to that, and it's a strategic decision, and some surveys are done specifically to be kept confidential with the uh, uh, people who run the survey. Um, my response would be, if governments use that as an excuse to violate people's human rights, then we can't let them off the hook. Governments are going to use a lot of reasons to violate people's human rights, and this may be one of them. Um, but it's one of the reasons why we all need to understand this information and use it. I would also say that governments should themselves be doing this survey because they need to understand the level of stigma and where it is high, they need to respond to it. So I would add to that, too, that on, the, for example, the same-sex marriage issue in the United States, much survey work was done indicating that the U.S. population in large part was actually ahead of legislation in the United States on same-sex marriage, and that absolutely did not stop eventually, finally, um, federal-level um, protections being enacted. So I, I, I understand absolutely where the question comes from, but I don't think there's a lot of evidence, is certainly on, on some of these social issues, that uh, putting data like this out into the public domain um, you know, provides excuses for restrictions. Of course, as long, Andrew, for your point, um, as, as, as activists uh, remain, you know, remain focused on it, um, because, because there's, there's dozens of examples of, 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 of survey data sort of indicating that the public is well ahead of the government and the policy is still coming through. Um, I want to thank Winston Lahour, who's actually been the one uh, advancing the slides and has handled all the technology for this. And again, thank you, Julia, and thank you, Andrew Flores, for presenting some very interesting data, and we look forward to uh, more work like this in the future. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. And thank you, everybody, per for participating, and have a good rest of your day or evening, depending on where you are. Mm -hmm. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.